sheets and safari sheets. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Greta Haithman. I'm the um, presiding barrister for this next Falls Trial Advocacy and Dispute Resolution Honors Council, or excuse me, Honors Board. I just wanted to say hello and welcome to everybody to our first annual Trial Advocacy Workshop Series. So we're happy to see everybody here and we hope to see you all over the next two weeks. And we would just like to give a big welcome to um, Mr. Mark Schlipper for coming today and helping us out and teaching us some great stuff about lit technology. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how many of you went through the 1L trial competition. Anyone here? All right. Well, I apologize. This is going to be a little bit repetitious of if you went to the one hour uh, uh, presentation leading up to it, you're going to see pretty much a lot of the same stuff. So uh, if you're here tomorrow, I'm going to break it down and spend a little bit more time showing you how media can be edited in this really PowerPoint presentations. But, um, I'm, here, I'm here as somebody who's kind of considered long in the tooth in the practice of law, but who has embraced technology. I've been using technology in the courtroom for about four or five years now, and uh, I'm here to tell you as somebody who's been using it on a daily basis, it's effective. It, it, it works. Uh, jurors love it. Uh, universally, the feedback has been positive. I've spoken to not only jurors, I've spoken to judges, I've spoken to courtroom deputies, I've spoken to court reporters, even public defenders. All of them have seen the power that courtroom technology brings to the courtroom. Uh, I've been in the office long enough to know that there was a day when you handled a lot of photographs, you handled a lot of documents, both with your witnesses and during your closing arguments. And it's a lot of picking up things, putting things down, making sure everybody in the jury box can see what you're doing. And what technology does is it allows you to free yourself up to just deal with and talk to the witness when it's evidence presentation or talk to the jury during closing arguments. And all you really need in your hand during a closing argument when you're making eye contact with each and every one of those jurors is a little presenter like this and you're pulling up exhibits, photographs, or video, or audio with just the click of a click of this presenter. And what it does is it enhances your argument. There's a right way to do PowerPoint, and there's a wrong way to do PowerPoint, and hopefully you'll be here tomorrow to hear about that. But the reason we use this in court now is because we live in a different age than the people who were sitting in the jury boxes when I was in your shoes. Right? Several years ago, uh, jurors didn't have cell phones, they didn't have smartphones, they didn't have iPads, they didn't receive all their information in digital format, they didn't have instant access to everything. I used to have a slide in my presentation that talked about uh, all the different electronic or digital devices that we can now carry. And there was a picture of Batman, and, and the, the joke was you needed a Batman utility belt to carry them all. And that was a slide I created maybe, well, less than two years ago. Even that slide is outdated now, because instead of carrying a separate digital camera, a separate PDA, a separate media player, a separate phone, they're all contained in one device now. Uh, that's how quickly technology is moving along. It's my little copyright disclaimer, just so you know. This is, this is your 30 seconds of ethics training right now. Um, this is what computers used to look like, believe it or not. This was an office computer, okay? We know now that computers aren't nearly that big. They're, they're streamlined. If you're not going to, going to be using your smartphone, you could do your work on something like this. Um, cell phones. When, when I was a teenager, my father got a, what was called, then called a car phone. And it mounted to the hump between the left seat and the right seat. And you couldn't take it out. It had one of those little spiral cords on it. And the electronics for that phone took up the entire width of the trunk. The entire width of the trunk you needed to run this thing. Right, things have changed. Soon they had the mobile phone, which you could carry around with you. <laughs> Big, great technology. You were no longer tied to your car if you want to make a phone call. But even that got a little bit bulky. Finally, they had the one-handed version. 
Okay, this is called the brick phone. It doesn't fit very well in your pocket, I can tell you that. But we know it's a different age now. You know, you've got Blackberries, you've got iPhones, uh, the Androids now are really big. Completely different time. Your jurors fit in this modern category. They're not the same people that were listening to cases 10, 15, and 20 years ago. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles, of course, is this right here, CSI. Right? Your jurors watch this stuff on television, and this is not real life. But what it does is it creates unrealistic expectations in your jurors' minds on what you can do in a courtroom, what you can do with evidence. I, uh, to this day, and I've been using this for about a year now, I've never watched this show, not once, I refuse to. But, I have a little presentation, and I think it goes something like this, the show does. Today's jurors are watching the television. So they come into court thinking every single case is going to be solved, prosecuted, or defended with some sort of neat new scientific process that doesn't really exist. But what the cool thing about technology is, when you don't have that science to back up your case, when you don't have fingerprints, you don't have DNA, you don't have gunshot residue on, on, the, on the shooter's hands, you're presenting your evidence in a more scientific way. So even though they're not getting it, scientific evidence, the technology feeds their need for science. And let's face it, today's jurors figure, hey, if it's on television, it must be true. So I present my evidence that way. Uh, everything I do in court, even before technology was big, uh, was based on this concept right here. It's called the visual trial. It's something I learned many, many years ago uh, when I was at the career prosecutor course in Houston. And basically, this is what it means. To see is to remember, to hear is to forget. What does that mean? That means if all you're going to do is talk to a jury, if all you're going to do is have your witness speak to a jury, chances are they're not going to remember your evidence as well as if you had used some sort of visual in conjunction with the spoken word. When you can back up the spoken word with a visual, while the words are being spoken, you're going to increase the chances your jurors are going to remember that piece of evidence. And I'm not just saying it because of that phrase. Uh, I apologize for that shadow. It's a difference between different versions of PowerPoint. But this is a study that was conducted by a federal commission. Now, there's a bench book that federal judges use. When technology is being used in the courtroom, kind of like the, 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 the rules, the rules of engagement. And there's some neat statistics in that bench book. 90% uh, of jurors indicated they were better able to see evidence and understand the attorney when they used evidence presentation technology. It's very simple. But the more compelling part of this study was the second part. The finding was in accord with statistics showing that after three days, people remember 15% of what they heard, but 65% of what they saw and heard. Now, if you think about that for a second, what is this statistic telling you? Anytime you can back up the spoken word with a visual simultaneously, you are increasing the chances by more than four times that your jurors are going to remember the significance of that evidence. Now, it may mean nothing for you who haven't been out trying cases, but when I started trying cases, 
we'd have a stack of photographs. Now, and then I've lived with the photographs for you know two years, however long the case lasted before we went to trial. And if you've taken evidence, you know, you know, you take those pictures, you walk up to your witness, you lay the foundation for them. If it's a medical examiner, let's say it's a group of 15 photographs from, from the autopsy. And the witness talks about them, lays the foundation, he asks the magic words, do they truly and accurately show the condition of the body, blah, blah, blah. Yes, here's the gunshot wound, here's the contact, here's the stippling, this is the ring of abrasion, whatever it is. And then you take those photographs, you go back and you put them on your table, and you move on to the next witness. You do it again now with the forensic investigator or the evidence technician, stack the photographs. Take them, put it on your table, and move on to the next witness. Now you know what those pictures are because you've, you've seen them dozens of times over the last couple of years. And you take for granted the jurors know them too. But the first time they get to see them are the few that you decide to pick up in your closing argument while you're making your argument. And you're walking in front of the jury with that photograph, or two photographs, or three photographs that you're picking up, putting down. And for starters, you have to make sure that everyone in that jury box sees it when you're making your argument, and hoping that when you put your finger in front of something, you're not blocking what you want them to see. So that's the first time you get to see it, which is kind of unfair to them. The rest of those photographs, they go back in the jury room, and now after several days, the jury's got to go back in that room and say, OK, now. Whose car is this? Which house was that? Because you didn't attach the visual to the spoken word. So what we do now in Cook County is we engage in what's called simultaneous publication. Every photograph we have is still mounted on a board, but we scan them. So you lay the foundation with the stack of photographs with the medical examiner. Okay, Dr. Dr. Smith, do these 10 photographs truly accurately show the condition of the body? Yes, they do. Go back to my table and put them down. All right, now, doctor, I want to show you what's been marked as People's Exhibit number 15. Click, pull up the digital copy on a large screen. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, that's the gunshot wound to the head. You can see the contact, you can see the muzzle, the contact on the skull, or the stippling, which is the burning of the gun into the soot in the, in, the, in the flesh. Now, the jury's looking at that digital photograph while the witness is testifying. And you do that for each photograph. What have you done now? You've now attached the visual to the spoken word, and you've increased by more than four times the chances that the jury can remember the significance of that evidence when they go back into the jury room. We do the same thing with audio. We do the same thing with video. Documents. A consent to search form, for example. If a witness is going to testify about it, put it up on the screen. A title chain for a car. Put it up on the screen. Let the jurors see it during your evidence presentation. It's more effective compelling way to present your evidence.